The amount of practice, studies show, for example, a student who goes to a lecture and then reviews that lecture on a daily to bi-daily basis. If you go out 30 days, will have nearly 95% of that material still in their memory. A student who did not review at all will have less than 20% of the material available to them. Okay? It's simply a case of giving students activities to produce that kind of interaction, because oftentimes they don't want to do that on their own. In other words, if there is an assignment, then that means there's nothing for me to do. Okay, so they do nothing. They don't actually review and practice that material. Here are the three major reasons why students have trouble remembering. This is from Daniel Schachter's book, who was the head of psychology at Harvard, called Seven Sins of Memory. Number one is they block, which means it's stress-related. Test anxiety is a blocking problem. They do know the material. There's something interfering, fear, stress, acute, short-term stress, things that are blocking that. And what we've been taught, because I've taught workshops on this for years, is the students need to understand it's a physical problem. They need to learn to physically relax to handle test anxiety and that stress. They need to calm their body to calm their mind. In other words, they need to change a behavior in order to get the brain to change the neurochemicals that it's making. Secondly is misattribution. This comes when students take a lot of classes that are similar in content. In other words, if you're taking chemistry, math, and physics all in the same semester, it's kind of easy to get those confused, the formulas, the processes, and you simply misattribute on the test, this was actually something we were using to solve a physics problem rather than a chemistry problem. The third thing is transience, loss over time, which means I didn't review, therefore I don't know. Okay? I did go to class, I did write it in my notes, I didn't practice it very much, I can't remember it. Well, I can't remember it because it's not there. It's lost, it's gone. It got reabsorbed into the brain's cellular material. How many of you know the lyrics to songs you do not want to know the lyrics to. <laughs> right? Let's think about this for a minute. Let's think about this. I know them perfectly. I've remembered them for 30 years. I did not try to learn them. I never consciously practiced them. And I wish I didn't know them. What is the power of memory? Practice, 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 okay? I know the Ode to Billy Joe. I don't want to know the Ode to Billy Joe. Last summer, each morning when I came downstairs and I would be about to grab the Cheerios, the Ode to Billy Joe would start playing in my head. It played all summer. And the only way I could get rid of it is to replace it with Big John. <laughs> so, if you ask this question to your students, they'll have the same answer, absolutely. And so you need to make the point to them, then that's how learning happens. Long-term repetition and practice. Now, songs are actually easier because they have a rhythm and a pattern to them, which actually makes them easier to remember. So what do you need to do? We need to work with our students, practice use, repetition, review, reflection, or other meaningful ways lead to long-term recall. The more ways you get them to use the information, the more memories they have for that information. Right? I have a memory related to smell, I have a memory related to the tactile experience and the kinesthetic process of writing it down, I have the memory of reflecting on it, I have the memory of talking about it, listening to it, reading it, all of those are separate memory paths. So each of those can lead me back to that information. The more senses we use, the better. One, because senses work synergistically, and second is each sense creates its own memory pathway. I have a memory for my vision of that information, for my smell of that information, for my touching of that information, my feelings about that inf All of those create separate memory pathways. And as a result of that, our students go into environments where they need to be able to express that information, and they have multiple ways to retrieve it. And we all know that. When we can't retrieve something, what do we do? We start going to another path. When I can't think of somebody's name, I go to the alphabet. And I just start at A. For some reason, I was trying to remember Cal Ripken. You know how Cal Ripken is, the guy who played the most consecutive games in baseball? 
two days. Couldn't think of his name, so I went right to the alphabet. It took me 10 seconds. Because <laughs> I had Sal in my mind. Sal, Sal something. Anyway, elaborations, <laughs> this is Schachter's work. Elaborations, good or bad, are probably at the mercy of our memories. The more different ways you use the information, the better. That's why rote memory is so problematic, is it's only a single pathway to that information. It's like me, let's say that this is, this is my house right here, OK? And back there in the corner is the lake. And in between is a huge forest. If I walk the same path every day to the lake, it's great. I got an incredibly well-worn, excellent path. But what do I do if a bunch of trees fall down and block my path? I can't get to the lake. That's the dilemma of students who just want to memorize the information. Because you ask them a test question that threw a tree into the path. And you want to know whether they can create a new path to that information. Okay. Well, if they have 10 paths, they can, almost always, without any problem. The student who wants to just memorize, in a rote sense, I want to memorize the answer, hasn't really learned very much, right? They can't transfer it, which is part of the definition. And that's hard for them to get over. The reason is they're using a tool that worked very well for them for a very long time, right? They went through 12 years of school and got rewarded for memorizing, you know? The old uh, saying, if, 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 if all you have is a hammer, you treat everything as a nail. Well, if all you know is how to memorize, you treat everything as something to be memorized. And we're faced with trying to get them to move away from that model to a thinking, processing model, and it's a big change. You know, 12 years is a long time to do something and then have to try to make a shift. So here are some of the things that we elaborate. One is the brain knows no difference between what's right and what's wrong in the sense that if you if a student believes they're studying the correct information, they can make wonderful elaborations for it, but it's still wrong because they had the wrong information. Okay. By the way, one of the ways you might get your students to really work together and to connect for the right information is to have the class create its own wiki site. You know, wiki is just a public site where you can load information. What I do with wikis is that becomes the class review site. It's open to every student, and I ask the students to simply put out on the wiki important information that they think every student in the class should know about the course. In other words, it's the study guide. Right? Two things happen. One is it's a communal effort, which is a good thing in learning. Two is it gets involvement on the students. Well, there's more than two. Three is I never do test review anymore. I never take class time to do a test review. The test review is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week on the wiki site. I go out onto the wiki site and I check it. I make sure the information's correct. And I add some things if I think they're missing some things. But I put the responsibility onto my students to create their own test review center. And it works really well. It, it can be very, very effective. Okay. Reflection, the lost art of learning is reflection. Why? Because we don't have much time. You know, school used to be about learn this, go home, take two days, think about it, read about it, ponder it, write up on it, and come back and we'll discuss it. Now, it's all kinds of new information, come back tomorrow, all kinds of more new information, come back tomorrow, all kinds of new information. So reflection is a powerful tool for creating memories because you do what? You think about how to use the information. I have students write a lot of um, summaries because I teach reading in part. Um, but summary causes the student to have to think, right? Think what was important in this material. They have to reflect on the material. Oh, let me go back. The last one here, recoding. Recoding simply means asking the students to put the information into their own words. Okay? In the end, the brain is really what John Rady calls a pattern-seeking device. We think in patterns, right? There's patterns in all of our subject matters. Chemistry is very hierarchical. You know, you got matter at the top and you got these little molecules at the bottom. Okay? Social science on the other side is not the least bit hierarchical. 
So we call a pivot subject. Pivot meaning there's a central idea and things impact upon that idea and those impacts change all the time like sociology would be. Recoding says to the student, can you put that in your own words? Well, their own words are the single most common pattern that they know. There's no more familiar pattern to them than their own language. If a student can't translate what you taught them into their own words, they don't know it. They don't understand it. When they can translate it, not only do you know they understand it, they've created a memory pattern that's easier for them to recall because it's their own pattern, their own language, their own examples. It's a great way to teach. Asking students for examples and metaphors and explaining your own words, and it's a great way to assess. I can assess instantly in class if you know it or you don't by saying, put that into your own words. Give me your own example. And what you find out is they, they memorized it, but they don't understand it, okay? All right, here are some other ways to elaborate. Singing, writing, visualizing, mapping, drawing pictures, all of these kinds of things work. 